a while ago. <laughs> Only a room full of Baptists could have looked so sad. <laughs> All right, so. <laughs> For months now, I've been talking about uh, the importance of making Jesus above all else. I told you how, when I was on sabbatical, I sensed God calling me to renew my commitment to make Christ above all in my life, in my mind, in my will, and especially in my affections. Uh, I wanted to extend that invitation to our church, to our community, to magnify Jesus above all in our lives. Uh, we want to come to terms with the greatness and the lordship of Jesus. Uh, we want to understand how to live out the lordship of Christ so that it makes a difference in our lives, our families, our church, and in our community. And we want to live in such a way that all the world would know that Jesus Christ is truly above all else. And we want to invite others to... Uh, make Jesus their king and their savior. So we've been looking off and on this spring or this winter and spring at the book of Colossians. So if you have your Bibles, look with me in Colossians 2. And I've told you how Christianity faced one of its most severe challenges in the ancient city of Colossae. You know, false teachers had sprung up there in the church as they had in all of the churches in which Paul ministered. These false teachers urged the church to move away from its Christian roots and to accept other religious ideals. So Paul writes, at least in part, to counter the false teaching. His main idea in the letter of Colossians still resonates in our culture and our times, where there are so many paths, so many beliefs, so many opinions for how to live one's life. But Paul really calls us to focus on Christ above all else. And if we believe that he truly is Lord, then that should affect the way we live our lives. Now, you've probably already heard today that this is Resurrection Sunday. So as we consume chocolate bunnies, as we hunt Easter eggs filled with good things, I want to ask you whether you truly believe Jesus is above all else in our salvation. And you say amen, but you should hear the sermon first. Okay. Because I wonder, I wonder, we live in a culture that struggles with grace. Especially those of us who follow Christ, we can really struggle with this whole idea of God's grace. Is Jesus a sufficient Savior? Or do we need to add something to Jesus so that our sin can be forgiven? Is Jesus really enough to make new life possible? Or do we need to add something more to Jesus so that we might have new and everlasting life? It's not unusual for someone to come and tell me that I preach too much on love and grace. What I need to preach on more is sin. And I always want to ask, do you have a particular sin in mind? What's yours? I have a sermon for that. But it's interesting. Is Jesus enough? We're all celebrating the death and resurrection of Christ. But what do we really believe about what we are celebrating? And so in the text, we're going to look at how Paul unpacks some truths for the Colossians about the resurrection or the death and resurrection of Jesus and the implication that it has for Christians. We are alive with Christ because Jesus is alive. And we should not exchange new life in Christ for any of the alternatives offered by this world. Including alternatives offered in the name of Jesus. Jesus is enough already. So let me tell you what I think 
Let's look at the text, Colossians chapter 2. I'll start reading in verse 8. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the basic principles of this world rather than on Christ. For in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form, and you have been given fullness in Christ, who is the head over every power and authority. In him, you were also circumcised in the putting off of your sinful nature, not with a circumcision done by the hands of men, but with the circumcision done by Christ, having been buried with him in baptism and raised with him through your faith in the power of God who raised him from the dead. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the written code with its regulations that was against sin and that stood opposed to us. He took it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Therefore, Do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. Do not let anyone who delights in false humility and the worship of angels disqualify you for the prize. Such a person goes into great detail about what he has seen, and his unspiritual mind puffs him up with idle notions. He has lost connection with the head, from whom the whole body, supported and held together by its ligaments and sinews, grows as God causes it to grow. Since you died with Christ to the basic principles of this world, why? As though you still belong to it, do you submit to its rules? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. These are all destined to perish with use because they are based on human commands and teachings. Such regulations indeed have an appearance of wisdom, but their self imposed worship, their false humility, and their harsh treatment of the body, but they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. Woo! Okay, so the false teachers in the church were causing people to lose sight of the fact that Jesus is above all else in our salvation and in our new life in Christ. Christians were being tempted to not just trust in the death and resurrection of Jesus for the forgiveness of sin and new life. They were being tempted to do other things, to assure their salvation, and in order to live a life that was not pleasing to Christ so much as that they wanted to live in a way that was pleasing to the other believers. Are you following me? Yeah. So Paul tries to bring them back to what is so essential, that Jesus Christ is a sufficient Savior. And we don't need to add anything to that. Let's look at what he says. The first thing I want to point out today is that the death and resurrection of Jesus provide new life and forgiveness of sin for those who believe. The death and resurrection of Jesus provide new life and forgiveness of sin for those who believe. In other words, nothing need to be added to Jesus, for the forgiveness of your sin and mine. And I hope that is good news for you today. What we see in verse 8 is that the church was tempted to submit to the requirements of man-made rules to live a life pleasing and acceptable to God. 
Paul describes this as hollow and deceptive philosophy that depends on human tradition. So this teaching represented humanity's attempts to arrive at truth and right living apart from God. It was incompatible with Christ and contrary to the work he did on the cross. Jesus Christ is an all-sufficient and all-sovereign Savior. Paul taught that there is a strong spiritual connection between Christ and believers. And believers are in Christ, and He is in believers. In God's mind, believers are included in the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. When I trust in Christ, I am included in His death, in His burial, and in His resurrection to new life. And that is enough. In verse 9, we see that Jesus is an all-sufficient Savior because of who He is, God in flesh and blood. The Bible tells us that Jesus is completely God. All the fullness of the deity lives in Him, and He is head over every power and authority. And when Paul uses that language, he's referring to spiritual beings. So Jesus is is preeminent over all creation. And because he is preeminent, he is above all else. That should eliminate any thought that we need other saviors just in case. I trust in Jesus, but just in case, because I'm really bad, I'm going to pursue other things as well. Because there doesn't hurt to have a plan B, right? Some of us need a plan C. But there is only Jesus. And that's what Paul is saying. The cross and the resurrection are, def- are the definitive means by which God has reconciled the world to himself. I am included in Jesus' death and his resurrection to, do- to new life. Nothing more need be done. In verses 9 through 14... We see that God includes believers in the death and resurrection of Jesus. So we receive Forgiveness of sin and new life through Jesus. When we were saved, we received all of Christ we will ever need. You believe that? You already have everything you need in Christ. Nothing is lacking in my salvation. I don't need to, I don't need to pursue extra credit somewhere else. I have everything I need. And the cross means that all of my sin is forgiven and I no longer must perfectly follow a list of rules to be pleasing to God. And Paul describes how I was indebted to God, a debt I could not repay. But Jesus took it and he nailed it to the cross. That debt is removed. It has been forgiven. I have been redeemed in Christ. So Christians need not seek any other saviors or make vain attempts to cancel the debt with something they do themselves. It does not depend on us. Yeah, Jonathan Edwards once said that the only thing I contribute to my salvation is the sin that made it necessary. In verses 10 and then in verse In verse 15, we see that through Jesus' death and resurrection, God defeated all the spiritual powers arrayed against us. Praise the Lord. You you may be very sophisticated and uh, believe that, or you may have a hard time believing that there are spiritual beings and spiritual realities out there beyond the realm of our senses that we cannot explain or control. You may have a hard time with all of that. Paul didn't. And in Scripture he tells us that those powers are the enemies of God. And they are arrayed against the people of God. However, Jesus is supreme and preeminent over every spiritual being or power in God's creation. And Paul says in verse 15 that Jesus has triumphed over any spiritual being who is an enemy of God. He has put them on display. They are defeated. 
No other allegiance is needed for our salvation in Christ. But as I told you a minute ago, I think Christians have always struggled with the sufficiency of Christ. So for instance, before the Protestant Reformation, Roman Catholic theology dominated Christianity. And this theology taught some things about salvation that we have rejected as Protestants. For instance, in Catholic theology, there are two different kinds of sin. One is mortal and the other is venial. Mortal sin is willful, heinous sin resulting in separation from God forever in hell if not confessed and repented from before death. If I die in mortal sin, then I am doomed forever. Are you following me? Yeah, venial sin is less serious sin. It is forgivable. It requires penance in this life or time in purgatory after death. So, if your little brother is a pest and you tell him to drop dead, that is venial sin. If you kill your little brother yourself, that is mortal sin. You following me? All right. Christians have struggled with this for millennia. In, in, his, in one of his books, the Christian author Brennan Manning, who is a former Catholic, tells this story. He says, here is a routine situation that every Catholic of my generation had to deal with. Let's say you were at a baseball game at Yankee Stadium on a Friday night in June 1950. Catholics are forbidden to eat meat on Fridays under penalty of mortal sin. But you want a hot dog. Now, just considering eating meat on a Friday is a venial sin. Wanting to is another. You have not moved out of your seat and you've already sinned twice. Now, what if you actually ate a hot dog? Have you committed a venial sin or a mortal sin? Well, if you think it's mortal, it may be mortal. But if you think it's venial, it still may be mortal. After much thought, you decide it's venial. You purchase the hot dog, clearly an act of free will, and you figure you can go confess your sin to the priest on Saturday night. But wait! Does a venial sin become mortal when you commit it deliberately? Well, that's a chance you take. What if you've forgotten it's Friday? In that case, eating the hot dog may not be a sin, but forgetting it's Friday definitely is a sin. What if you remember it's Friday halfway through the hot dog? Is it a venial sin to finish it? If you throw it away, is wasting food a sin? Within five minutes, you've committed enough sin to land you in purgatory for a million years. The simplest thing to do is not to take any chances. Stay away from Yankee Stadium on Friday. Now, don't feel too bad for our Catholic friends. We Baptists can lay the same guilt on each other, and we do, do we not? How many were not allowed to play cards or to go to a dance? for fear that you would slip right into the pits of hell. I want to tell you that my grandparents would be rolling over in their graves right now, the way that some of you play 42, here in the church building, without shame. Our fears and misunderstanding of grace causes us to lose focus on the salvation won for us through the death and resurrection of Jesus. What Jesus did on the cross and in the resurrection is enough for us to have forgiveness of our sin and new life in Christ. Um, it is accomplished. It is finished. Be careful that you are not trying to add anything to it in order to make your life more pleasing to God. Jesus has done enough. The question I want to ask is, do I trust and live in the forgiveness of sin and new life made possible through the death and resurrection of Jesus? Is Jesus the one I'm clinging to? for new life.
and forgiveness of sin. The second thing I want to point out in the text is that new life in Christ is not the result of following rules or duplicating the spiritual experiences of others. New life in Christ is not the result of following rules or duplicating the spiritual experiences of others. So you might ask, what do I have to do to live this new life in Jesus every day? What does that look like for me? If I want to live the Christian life, it would help if the Lord gave me a checklist and I could just check those things off. Done, 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 hallelujah, you know. Well, Paul moves from his assurance of Christ's complete victory to specific warnings against the false teaching leading people astray in the church. He says some important things here. First, we see that new life in Christ is not the result of conquering my sinful nature through self-denial, self-discipline, or personal effort. Let me say that again. New life in Christ is not the result of conquering my sinful nature through self-denial, self-discipline, or personal effort. Now, in the church, some people, some false teachers were telling the Christians that they needed to please God by observing special days, especially those special days given in the Old Testament. And by observing these special days, it would make them holy and pure and therefore acceptable to God. Paul argued against Christians submitting to this teaching. Such things may appear to be spiritual, but spiritual life is a matter of relationship with Christ. And it's a matter of the heart's commitment to Christ. To consider these matters as necessary to the Christian life would be to undermine the work of Jesus on the cross. If human effort was effective, the work of God would be unnecessary. And Christ would have died for nothing. And believe me, beloved, I respect all of your discipline. Some of you are very disciplined. But God's not impressed. And if you and I could win our salvation, the cross was for nothing. The rules and restrictions were based on human teachings, not on the word of God. Therefore, they had become a burden to the people and had no power to transform a person's life. In verse 18, we see that new life in Christ is not the result of of having spiritual experiences that result in pride and puffing up my ego. What we have in the church here is that the heretics were teaching that their spiritual experiences should be the norm for worship. In other words, they were saying in the church that if you were as spiritual as me, you would have the same spiritual experiences as me. You would want to worship the way that I do. Now surely no Christian here expects everybody to worship the same way that they do. So Paul refers to what they're saying. He, he talks about the worship of angels. And this refers to the kind of worship that takes place around the throne of God all the time. The heretics were saying, hey, I know how to worship. I have been in the very presence of God. If you worship like me, if you do what I do, then you also will be in his presence. If you don't worship the way that I do, you will never experience the presence of God. And you know what Paul says to that? Malarkey! It's not true. And the result of this thinking, he says, is that people become prideful, but empty. Empty. Because their focus is on themselves. People have a tendency to live on this constant treadmill of attempting to recreate spiritual experiences. And what Paul wants us to remember is that Jesus, rather than those experiences, determines spiritual reality. Everything depends on Jesus what he has already accomplished through his death and resurrection. In verse 19, we see that I live my new life in Christ by maintaining my personal connection to Jesus and to his body. 
for spiritual growth and development. Paul says the whole body of Christ receives its nourishment from the head. There is no other source for strength and growth for anyone else except for the body, uh, being, the body being connected to the head who is Jesus. My spiritual growth, our spiritual growth is the result of our connection to Christ individually and collectively. Um, as I'm connected to Christ, I am also connected to his body, the church. And God causes us all to grow together. I meet a lot of people in our community who love Jesus but don't like the church. And they like this idea that I don't need the church in order to worship the Lord. I hear that a lot. I have a theological term that Paul was affectionate of to describe that. It's also malarkey. You can't embrace Christ without being connected to the body of Christ. That's the spiritual reality. Any suggestion of spiritual growth apart from Jesus or the church is a false spiritual reality. Spiritual growth occurs according to my connection to Christ and to the body of Christ. Both go together. I've told you before, it's like getting married. When you get married, you also get the in-laws. That's me. When you come to faith in Christ, you get me. What's for lunch? I can't wait. Christians sometimes like to sell each other a bill of goods. For whatever reason, we try to convince one another that the others are not doing enough. That there's more. In advertising, sometimes people use what's called the before and after technique. It's a popular a visual form of advertising because it allows the audience to see instantaneously the difference a product, service, or technique can make. And so in before and after advertising, you show how bad the situation was before, and then you show the possibilities of after. After the product, after the method, after whatever, this is what's possible. And people need to connect that before and after and see the possibilities for themselves in order to embrace the product. So here's an example of before and after advertising. Now, I don't know, but this may not be honest. And here's what was happening in the church. There were people in the church at Colossae telling the Christians that to live the Christian life, they had to do certain things and not do certain things. And the focus was on human effort. It was false advertising. They were saying, do these things, live this way, worship this way, and you will make yourself pleasing to God. And Paul wanted the church to know that's not true. You are pleasing to God because of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The key to living the Christian life, if I wanted to recommit my life to Jesus, what should I do? The answer is to strengthen your connection to Jesus and strengthen your connection to the body of Christ. Everything depends on that regarding our spiritual growth our maturity, our day-to-day life in Christ. Every moment of every day, I seek out the Lord Jesus, and I yield to Him in faith and obedience. And then I seek to surround myself with people who do the same things, people who are committed to accomplishing the Lord's mission and purposes on earth. I cast my lot with these people. I want to be all in. And I want them to be able to count on me in their journey of faith. So the question I ask, how strong is my personal connection to Jesus Christ and to his body, the church? Am I connected to the Lord and to his body in this world? The answer determines the nature of my spiritual growth from one day to the next.
So to close today, I want to invite you to consider making a couple of different decisions. First of all, I invite you to trust and live in the forgiveness of sin and new life made possible through the death and resurrection of Jesus. Today's the day. Trust in Christ. On this Resurrection Sunday, trust in Jesus for the forgiveness of your sin and for new life. Secondly, I invite you to intentionally draw close to Christ and to his church so that the Spirit will transform your life into the likeness of Christ. Focus less on your effort to make yourself pure and instead focus on drawing close to Christ and to his people. The Lord will take care of the rest. You are acceptable to Christ because of his death and resurrection. Everything else falls short. Trust in Christ. So in a moment I'll pray and the Marcy will come and lead us in a hymn of response, how do you need to respond to the Lord on this Resurrection Sunday? You can respond to the Lord while we sing. If you feel led, you can come to the altar and pray. I'll be standing down here while we sing. If you want to come and uh, pray with me or share something with me, you're welcome to do that. And when this service is over, I'm going to be out in the foyer for a while. I would love to visit with you about what the Lord is saying to you today. Let's pray together. Lord, I thank you for grace, the reality of grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all my sin. Uh, Lord, save me from the temptation to add anything to it, rules, rituals, my own best efforts. Instead, help me to trust completely in the death and resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that each day you would give me the grace to draw close to you and to cast my lot with your people and to be all in so that they can count on me as I count on them in this journey of faith. Lord, I pray that your Spirit would move in the lives of all of those who've gathered to worship you today that today they would encounter the risen Lord and that it would make all the difference for them. May your will be done. We love you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with me while we sing? I hear the Savior say, Thy strength in Jesus.
Bradley, would you stand down here where everybody can see you? This morning, it's my privilege to introduce to you Beverly Bigham, who's been visiting the church for a while, and she came this morning to tell me that the Lord believes that, he's, that, she, uh, that God has led her here. She believes that God has led her here to unite with our church by promise of letter from the First Baptist Church in Freer, Texas. So if you would just celebrate uh, what God has done and acknowledge that uh, you're accepting her into our family of faith, and if you would commit to walk beside her in the days to come, would you say amen? Amen. And I know uh, on your way out today, uh, Beverly, they're going to want to come by and meet you personally. So if you don't mind standing there for a little bit, they will want to come and give you a hug and uh, maybe give you something to eat. I haven't had breakfast. That's what's on my mind. Seems like there was something else I was going to say, but it's gone. So our deacon of the week is B.J. Thomas. B.J., would you come and close this? In prayer? Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, as we come today on Resurrection Sunday to remember your death and burial and resurrection, we just ask you to bless us. Father, just ask you to be with us as we go along our way. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right. Uh, I, before you leave, um, those of you who uh, participated in our creative arts display out here about Christ being above all, thank you uh, for your creativity and for sharing that with us. And uh, so anytime this week, you're free to come by and, uh, and pick up your items. So... We are, we are not going to keep them for you, but uh, you can come by and get those. So if you've not seen that, if you'll go by and look, we've got some tables and, and things out there. All right, we're going to end with Because He Lives. Because He Lives, I can face tomorrow. Because He Lives, all Happy Easter.